Welcome to State of the Science. The topic for today's uh, conversation is integrating approaches to type 1 diabetes cures, creating a roadmap for a diabetesome to connect interdisciplinary research. And today, um, you know, if this is a new way of talking about research in the field of type 1 diabetes. It's uh, the series itself will be a celebration of the power of debate and discussion that women scientists bring to type 1 diabetes research. And we have a very, uh, a very broad and global audience of scientists here today, and we thank everyone for joining. I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists. They're going to set the stage for the discussion, and then we have two polls um, to, to you know, put out to the audience. Conversation will be free-flowing, like a cross-idea town uh, exchange and a town hall and a respectful debate. We're going to pause at two different time points to conduct polls of the audience and have everyone uh, weigh in on, on those polls. So a couple of pro tips for attendees to submit a question. You can put it in the Q&A. You can submit questions throughout the presentation. Participants can actually upvote their favorite questions. And at the end of the session, we'll answer questions as time allows. This event's being uh, recorded and will be housed on our YouTube channel after um, the live presentation. So in the interest of saving most of the time for discussion, I'm gonna do a very brief introduction for each of our scientists. We could, uh, seriously, we could take up the whole time discussing each of them. These are some of the top of the top scientists in type one diabetes and interdisciplinary work. Um, this is, you know, really like a dream team for this discussion. Um, so we really value their time and their participation. Um, you uh, may have heard of, I'm going to start uh, just sort of at the top here with uh, Dr. Viva Anand. She's coming to us from MIT and IBM. She's a research scientist um, in the Center for Confrontational Health at IBM and um, the Thomas J. Watson Research Center in Cambridge. And her current research focuses on applying data mining and machine learning techniques to draw novel insights from health data sets, especially from prior observational studies, clinical trials, and electronic medical record and real-time biosensors. And congratulations to her and her group for their new paper that came out in Nature Communications this week, Progression of T1D from Latency to Sym Symptomatic Disease Predicted by Distinct Autoimmune Trajectories, um, that was just a phenomenal paper, so I look forward to hearing a little bit about that if she has time or interest. Um, Dr. Nina luning Prock comes to us from UPenn, and um, she studies the antibody repertoire in health and disease and is on the board for AIRR, which is also known as the Adaptive Immune Receptor Repertoire Community. And uh, thank you uh, for joining us, uh, Dr. Prock. Dr. Burt, Noel Burt, comes to us from MIT The Broad. And she's the Director of Operations and Development for the Diabetes Research and Knowledge Portals at the Broad Institute, where she leads the Data Coordinating Center and Community Research at, uh, Resource Efforts for several large-scale international, international consortia and public-private partnerships in human genetic studies uh, of common metabolic diseases. She also develops a scientific user experience and community engagement for the Knowledge Portal Network, which is a data and software platform to facilitate innovative and intuitive analysis and visualization of biomedical data for common diseases. Dr. Shannon Turley from, is coming to us from Genentech. She trained at Yale. She had a faculty position at HMS before moving to San Francisco to become vice president of immunology at Genentech. Um, Dr. Kate Speak comes to us from uh, Benaroya Research Institute and she's a the lead translational scientist there in Seattle. She coordinates BRI's experimental medicine unit and is an investigator in two NIDDK funded consortia, the T1 uh, Diabetes Trial Net and the T1D uh, Acute Pancreatitis Consortium. Uh, let's see, I don't know if Dr. Matthew's here yet, but um, I'll say hopefully she'll join us. She comes to us from France where she leads in Nodia. Dr. Linda Nimelio is coming to us from Indiana University, and her, she works in clinical research with a focus on type 1 diabetes prevention, beta cell preservation, and new technologies and therapies. Dr. Radhika Pak Busi, um, MD, PhD, coming from University of Michigan. She's a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine, Division of, of Metabolism, Endocrinology, and Diabetes, or MEND, and she's the co-director of the Neuropathy Center at the University of Michigan. She also uh, leads the Diabetes Complications Clinic at the University of Michigan, and she's the Larry D. Soderquist Professor in Diabetes. Professor in Diabetes. She's, she has a, ho uh, a whole list of accolades, and I'm just going to read them. She's a professor in internal medicine, metabolism, endocrinology, and diabetes, as I mentioned. She's the vice chair of clinical research um, in the Department of Internal Medicine. She's the director for clinical research, mentoring, and development at the Caswell Diabetes Institute. And she's the co-director of the JDRF Center of Excellence at the University of Michigan and the president-elect 
uh, medicine and science for the ADA. So she has a lot of things going on um, in this field. And then Dr. Danielle Dean coming to us from Vanderbilt, um, where she is the assistant professor of diabetes, uh, endocrinology and metabolism and assistant professor of, of um, MBNB at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Her lab studies mechanisms regulating the regeneration and function of pancreatic islet cells. Okay, I got through that mouthful. So uh, thank you again. I mean, amazing. You, you've, you've done so much for the field, all of you, and, um, uh, and, have, and have a long history um, of, of contributions. So I'm gonna quickly just pivot to the work of um, Katerina Volz. She, her company is Occam's Razor. And from this company or you know, from her basically comes the concept of a Parkinson. I'm gonna just quickly share this slide. And so this is the concept that she's sort of uh, bringing forward with her company, Occam's Razor, where she you know, has created several layers of data and now is you know, forming them into a knowledge graph and mining them using ML and AI. And so with this in mind, you know, um, we, I, I, I'm, I'd like to pose it to the panelists to ask them what might, you know, we, we looked at sort of what a Parkinson looks like. That's what she's trying to create. What might a diabetesome look like for type one diabetes? How might each of you envision, you know, how such a roadmap could be best created to connect all of the dis interdisciplinary research that could fully illustrate the etiology of type one diabetes? And so we'll just sort of stop, start at the top and um, follow the, you know, the list um, of introductions and ask each of the panelists, what, what, are, what are their thoughts around this? And I, I'll ask Dr. Anand to start. So Monica, um, I think having uh, a layered approach, uh, and I have not looked very carefully at the diagram you just shared, maybe a good one. It's trying to understand, um, as, as we've also shown in our, in our work, that uh, looking at data at various time points in a person's life as they go towards uh, the development of our progression to diabetes, there are various things that can be quantified in different ways. And uh, this approach uh, is useful uh, in many, many conditions and maybe also useful in diabetes, especially type one diabetes. And that's the work that I would like to highlight. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned our work with, uh, that just got published in Nature Communication this week. Uh, so that looks at uh, progression and development of island autoimmunity right from very early ages right from right after birth and looking at how different um, the heterogeneity in development of thyroid autoimmunity across the lifespan of uh, until they become diagnosed with uh, diabetes or even in those with uh, who are not diagnosed what are the patterns so it may be a good way to understand you know the layered approach again i think that's what i'm pointing to so that that would be my perspective great yeah okay. that's um you know, that's, that's a valued perspective. What about Dr. Burt coming from, you know, the whole, um, the, the big amp? Oops, I can't hear you. Yeah. Um, that's a great question, actually. Um, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. And I consider myself very lucky because I would not call myself a type one diabetes specialist. I come at this from human genetics, that's my training. I'm mainly working in type two for the last 15 years and more, more recently converting to type one um, because you know we work on this very large accelerated medicines partnership for common metabolic disease, which is a public private partnership between industry and the NIH to essentially develop better targets for common metabolic disease. And so type one diabetes is a cornerstone disease there. So that's how we've started to come at this disease um, in our particular group. And um, from my perspective, I think I think the, what the field is doing to try and make the various approaches and ways that people are studying type 1 diabetes accessible to others is the first most important thing to do because the accessibility of the results and the data that we're generating is critical. But these approaches to back in this Occam's razor, um, the idea, I love that idea, but I think one of the most valuable things, you know, you can, as a software engineer, you can answer questions and build resources to integrate all the data and machine learning and perform natural learning on it. But if you don't have scientists and um, folks 
doing structured questions and developing hypotheses that feed into that resource, the resource is essentially invaluable. So I think one of the most important things in creating the diabetes zone, from my perspective, is engaging in the right scientific questions and structured hypotheses that you then can use to fuel back to those layered data. Because if the layered data is overwhelming, I think to most biologists, you're like, wow, I have all these resources, what do they all mean? But if you ask them very naturally, what do you wanna learn? And you have those questions very much in a way that someone could actually ask those of a platform or of a service or of a um, interdisciplinary um, resource, I think that's the way that we're gonna actually get at a diabetes zone. So that's my perspective um, from, very, from a different, coming in from a different field. Yeah, no, that's great perspective. So you, so if you had some kind of platform that had excellent UI, UX, that the scientists who are trained in the field could really access and and move move fluidly within, you think that would be very helpful. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. Um, Dr. Prock, would you like to have a word? Sure. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, really excited to be here with the, with. Uh, these distinguished colleagues. Um, so one of the key things I think for doing um, this type of analysis is having the right data. And I, I think this, I just wanna go back to the point that Bima made about uh, you know, looking at longitudinal studies in, in patients with disease over different time points in their illness. Uh, but I think the other part is sort of looking at different tissues within an individual with diabetes. And a lot of the studies in humans, of course, are done on the blood. Uh, and so one of the efforts that I'm part of, um, and I'm really just a small part of a much bigger group of people, um, is a consortium known as the Human Pancreas Analysis Program. And this is a, a multidisciplinary study um, with lots of investigators uh, querying different aspects of tissues of organ donors who have type 1 diabetes. And um, so there are groups, for example, who are, um, you know, looking at so the organ procurement is actually, so just to start from that, is, is quite impressive. So there are type 1 diabetes donors, there are also healthy donors, uh, and there are also healthy organ donors who are autoantibody positive. Uh, so um, we can't, of course, do the longitudinal types of studies that Viva is talking about since you only die one time, but what you can do is look in the different groups um, of, of individuals who may be at higher risk or actually have the disease outright. And so within um, the human pancreas analysis program, it's a, it's a group of, of three different universities, University of Pennsylvania, where I am, um, Vanderbilt University and the University of Florida. And there are several investigators and I'm part of the, what's called the immunology core of that group that consists of Mike Betts, uh, Nicolas Tourakis, Todd Brusco, uh, Michaela Lochi, Golnas Fahedi, um, and Ali Naji, who's one of our, our two um, co-PIs of the effort. And we're generating lots of data, flow cytometry data, site seek data, attack seek data. Um, also looking at some analysis of different cell types to try to look um, also at spatial resolution of cells. So I think we're, you know, we're gonna be generating these fairly massive data sets. Um, and of course the, the topic near and dear to my heart is immune repertoire profiling. And we'll be doing uh, that on these uh, organ donors as well. So uh, the unique feature of it is that we'll have access to these different tissues um, and we're putting all of this into a publicly accessible database called PAN-CDB. Uh, so you can go in there and you can download data from different organ donors. Um, and I think it's a very nice tool for the community to, to be aware of. Yeah, that's excellent. I, you know, so will will it be very standardized um, that data set? You know, sometimes when you look at other data sets, even like dbGaP and things, they it's not as standardized. So it's a little harder to work with. I, that's what I've heard anyway. No, you're right. That, that that's half the battle with any kind of data sharing effort is to have um, well annotated metadata and to to make it user friendly, as it were. And so this is something that we all struggle with. Um, and that's one of my other hats is actually the air community um, where we're doing a lot of data standardization work. So specifically for, for the human pancreas analysis program, uh, there are certain core studies that are being done on all of the donors. And then there are other studies that are more, um, what Noel was talking about a moment ago, sort of more hypothesis driven. Um, but the, the core sort of standard data sets are uh, available on all of the donors um, that have been well characterized. 
that sounds like it's going to be an excellent, uh, you know, repository and place for people to go. Thank you so much for talking about it and sharing it. You're welcome. Um, how about uh, Dr. Turley coming from Genentech? What, uh, what's your impression? Hi, thanks so much for inviting me here today. I'm learning an, a whole lot already from all of you and there's not a lot more that can be said. These are all fantastic ideas. I guess one thing I would bring um, that hasn't been said so far is the idea of um, ensuring that the cell biology community, so that the folks that are thinking about the physiology of the beta cell, um, beta cell intrinsic changes in autophagy and metabolism and cell survival and such, as well as immunologists and thinking about this disease. And then finally, folks thinking about the microenvironments, so cells that may be providing trophic factors for the beta cell, and then also for the instructing immune cells on how to get into the tissue and how to interact with, with the beta cells. So thinking about these three different communities and making sure that they're talking as much as possible. And we do this a lot in drug development for other diseases where ultimately the epithelial cell is failing and the organ is no longer working because of the failure of, the, of that, whatever the essential epithelial cell is. But ensuring that we're not only thinking about it from the immunology perspective, but, but the um, cell biology of the, of the beta cell itself or the epithelial cell itself. And then the tissue microenvironment, which is something that um, is near and dear to my heart, but certainly influencing disease outcome um, in T1D, but also in other diseases. Yeah, I, I heard an excellent talk from your colleague, uh, Aviv, Aviv Rajev recently, she's also at Genentech and, and, and really the whole way, she, uh, the whole talk was really about this layered approach that you're just, you know, kind of highlighting and um, how that you are all, how, how Genentech really does that so well in their work. So um, yeah, I, I think you're, you're really right. It's, and, and this brings again, this whole idea of the layered approach that that there's yeah. that that the connections need to be kept in mind because it's not yeah. just it's it's also important for us and how because we're we're ultimately trying to make medicines and so the approach to drug development for us is multi layered as well so you know thinking about what can we attack this from different you know looking at different cellular and tissue compartments as a way to address the disease and combination therapies that may you know, try to dampen an immune response, but also provide a factor that, you know, helps the beta cell to um, whatever proliferate or survive. So the multi-layered approaches can be thought of from many different angles and certainly our approach to drug development at Genentech. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, how about doctors speak from um, Benaroya? What's your impression of the sort of creation of a diabetesome? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to sort of meet all these exciting people today. It's it's really a nice treat to get to be on this call. And you know, I think like many others that I'm I'm seeing here, my work sort of sits at that intersection of big data, biomarker development, and and clinical research development and conduct in type one. And and I think that we've already hit on one of the biggest issues that that sometimes is overlooked, and and I think might be underrepresented a little bit in that slide from Dr. Boltz, which is that connection between the omics scale data that we're so able to generate in the lab and you know, really deep clinical or metabolic data that can be collected in, you know, in clinical trials and also via electronic medical records. You know, making sure that as we think about a diabetes zone, that, that, that we make sure that there's a place that can bring all of that together and make it accessible without being personally identifiable you know, is a big challenge that we're going to face in the development of, of uh, diabetesome, right? Because, because this is a long described problem that Noel, I think, already touched on too. You know, omics data, most of this data, and the absence of a really clear understanding of the demographic features, the clinical features, and, and importantly, what happened with someone's diabetes, you know, really is going to detract from what we can learn if, if those two pieces aren't brought together really carefully. Um, you know, as a community, I think we're really, really good at, at generating and analyzing each individual layer of those data too, I want to note, right? So many of us are putting together these kind of beautiful papers that, that describe, you know, as Viva recently did, the autoantibody data or transcriptomic data or genetic data, right? We're really good at working within those layers. And often there is some amount of kind of clinical or metabolic information that gets integrated but a truly integrated analysis that moves across all of those layers and having um, 
in a publicly available, well-tested, well-vetted, standardized tools that let us, you know, think in that kind of multidimensional way um, are going to be really critical. And, and I know that it's a place that our bioinformatics colleagues are, are, you know, working and trying to make, you know, big strides. And one place we can be is to support them by kind of providing well-curated, really clean data for them to work with in order to help develop those tools for us to all to help think about this work. Um, I think the last thing I want to note is that you know there are obviously very huge developments in, in AI and machine learning in these recent years, but you know to give those tools a chance to tell us what we want to learn about diabetes progression, you know, especially if our expectation is that those algorithms are going to address this kind of big multi-omic problem we're probably gonna need bigger ends than many of us have the opportunity to work with in a lot of our studies. And, and so, you know, to get to that, I wanna echo something that Noel pointed out and what one of a kind of recent um, panelists in this series pointed out, which is that as a community, we can just work harder to collect and to annotate and to make available each of those individual layers as we generate them. And that annotation piece is extremely important and it's never the most fun, but it is, it's totally critical, as we all know, to the work that we do. Um, you know, as, as more and more of that kind of clean, annotated data becomes available, that's what's going to let those machine learning and AI tools, you know, give us what we want to know, you know, beyond predicting what kind of shoes I'm going to buy tomorrow. So I, I think that that's, um, that's sort of where, where I'm at in thinking about this as, as a question. It was really so well said. I mean, you really captured so many things there and, and really tapped on them. Uh, some of the most important things uh, that I've heard from the community also, just in, the, in, the, in this whole State of the Science series. I wondered if the two industry, um, you know, uh, representatives, you know, both uh, Dr. Anand and Dr. Turley might just weigh in on that a little bit. When industry, you know, generates data, do they have um, a way of like a curator that does all this annotation as part of the team? And, and how does that differ from what happens in academia? Like where it seems to me that academics have to sort of like curate their or annotate their own and maybe it may, is, is it easier in industry? What's the, what's the deal? Uh, maybe I can start. So when you talk about annotation, to me, I, I, I think as uh, some of you pointed out, you know, we are probably working with like comics level data and uh, other uh, similar data uh, that needs to be married to the clinical data, right? And and then uh, the annotation occur. That's the, the 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 view I have about annotation. Maybe I'm misrepresenting it at the level that others are talking. But if that were to happen, you know, I, I think there's a big challenge as many of you have pointed out the scale of the data and the, the, the openness of the data and how we can do it. I think the other way is to learn from small data, which is where a lot of the technologies are going, you know, some samples, but then be able to scale it up based on, you know, data that is not annotated uh, and try it out. And that's where I think uh, some of these technologies as they call these foundational models are being developed um, uh, in the AI and machine learning world and where uh, you know they are working with uh, different kind of data sets to understand how this annotation can be automatized so as to speak as opposed to you know human providing that input you know if you can learn from small data and scale it up that's the way to go uh, that would be sort of my perspective about it interesting and thank you I don't have much to add to that, just to say that, you know, I think big drug companies and biotech companies who have been working with large data sets for a long time and, and have some, you know, we do a lot of, they're annotating data constantly, uh, clinical data constantly. I think. Whoops. She's, she's been lost. <laughs> she's frozen. Oh, shoot. Maybe she can come back in. Can't hear you. She's frozen. Mm. Well, let's we'll we'll wait and hear I, back. But yeah, can I, I go back to a point that Kate made. Yes. Is, is that okay? I think Kate, I completely agree with you. Um, 
But I, I got to say, I have, I have another thought on that, which I think is one of the challenges we're find, facing as we build a resource that attempts to do all this. And you know, the way we, we think about it is we think about we allow the experts who curate and annotate their specific domain to do that work. But one of the things we've been struggling with is um, people who want to use the resource say, I want to see this type of data. I want to see this. I want to do that. And I think that all is great. But one of the things we struggle with is we can't just magically make them see it unless we know what question they want to ask of it. And that's what's stalling so much of our ability to create these better machine learning tools or these resources that allow access to the distilled results from said things. So one of the things I think that um, is going to be really critical and, and, and actually potentially leave these software resources kind of um, left untapped is forcing the folks on these calls to really think hard about how they would actually use such a resource. Like what query would they literally type into a computer or an API or in a public download or into a visualization to get an answer sent back to them? Yeah, because no, I, I these, totally agree. I think those right? are so tricky. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree. I, I think that, um, you know, the sort of anecdotal or apocryphal sort of concept about AI and, and, and machine learning in, in type one in particular, right, is that if you give the machine all the data and just let it play around, it's going to tell you that glucose is important in diabetes, right? right. <laughs> so, so, right, we, we have to come in with something that is a lot bigger than that and a lot more important than that as the, as the people who are asking these questions. I totally agree. You know, I think this is a place that type one diabetes trial net has done a, a good job in the sense that they you know, took a step back several years ago and made a list of, okay, here are the critical key questions that we want to address with the kinds of samples that we're collecting. Even if we don't have that data yet, like this is where we need to get as a community. And I think doing that on a bigger scale um, across multiple disciplines in type one is kind of where we need to get, right? They thought about that from, from the perspective of people who design clinical trials and think about at-risk subjects, but perhaps you would want to make that bigger, right? And bring in people who think about the tissues and who think about, you know, other aspects of the disease. I, I totally agree though, that kind of expert, you know, kind of looking down on this and saying, here's what's actually important is totally critical. It feels uh -huh. like that maybe you could bring in questions from interdisciplinary work, like, you know, neuroscience or something, you know, something just coming in from another fresh idea to a fresh perspective too to ask. And thank you, Dr. Turley, for rejoining us. Sorry about that. Did you want to finish your thought? No, I think I made my point um, okay. already. So <laughs> sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. It was my Wi-Fi. Okay. Um, um, well, let's see. Let's let's sort of move through our panel a little more. Uh, Dr. Demelio, do you want to weigh in? Um, sure. Uh, and so I want to also thank everybody for coming. These have been great discussions. And thank you to Monica for hosting um, this series um, for everybody. Uh, it's nice to meet some of you that I've not met before on this setting. Um, I, think the, I think my role in this conversation will be to talk a little bit about the, the patient perspective and kind of the right-hand side of the diagram you showed um, and the need to kind of get um, engagement and be able to translate this back to um, people that um, either are, are at risk of diabetes or are living with the disease um, and um, figure out ways to make this kind of complex system translatable um, to them um, in a way that would uh, spur the engagement that um, is needed to, to get this uh, to the next stage. I'll also echo the, um, the need to be able to have data that's um, analyzable besides just glucose. Um, I like that point uh, that we can, you know, kind of pull out of these data sets and look at. And I think as we recognize um, more and more that type one diabetes is, we had another session like this on, is it, you know, is endotypal? So is it, is it um, that type one diabetes is not a single disease? Um, having grown up in the 1970s when Richard Nixon waged his war on cancer, um, when we thought cancer was potentially one disease, um, you know, looking at diabetes and breaking it down and tailoring therapies and explaining to the community why it's taking us so long and, um, and uh, starting trials that will enroll people based upon biomarkers and based upon different characteristics rather than a one size fits all approach um, will help us with combinations and staging eventually of different therapies over time. And um, I think that groups like TrialNet and Kate, I appreciate this shout out to TrialNet, which um, I'm also very engaged in, um, can really help us. But um, as we move to general population screening, it's going to be really critical that we um, have uh, even better messaging out to 
uh, providers of care for, for patients, but then also for um, people that would participate potentially be participants in our in in research so that we can fill in the right hand side and move back and then get more data for um, many of you on this call to analyze and um, for um, for the community to work with as a whole. Can I just ask, do you think that means that all pediatricians should be sort of like involved in gathering data or just endo pediatric endos? It has to go back, I think, to pediatricians and family practitioners and to the general community. The hard thing is that with um, so much going on and so much on a, a general provider's plate, uh, it's gonna be important that we only ask them to do things that are particularly meaningful and actionable, I think, um, such that they can, um, they, uh, there's like, on the one hand, we're really excited about the prospect of having therapies for prevention of type one and for new therapies for beta cell preservation and new technology and new therapeutics and all those sorts of things. On the other hand, we have to be careful on the burden, but I think it's going to require, um, require engagement, especially as we move to more general population work. Um, it'll require that primary care pediatrics to get engaged. Yeah, some incentive. Um, it does seem that, you know, the big providers have an incentive because once someone gets this disease at a young age, the burden, um, healthcare burden is very high. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're a stakeholder in that play. Mm -hmm. um, thanks so much. And now um, I wondered if Dr. Um, Papusio, Busio, sorry, um, could join us uh, and, and, and have a word coming to us from uh, University of Michigan. Well, thank you very much, Monica, for having me. And uh, I have to echo my colleague. I'm really thrilled to be part of a very distinguished panel. Very nice meeting you um, um, as well. So um, I guess I will also bring you a little bit of a different perspective. And I have been really very privileged and fortunate to be both a clinician scientist and a scientist. So I do provide care to these patients in my daily life. And I also actively been fortunate to participate in a lot of the research that has changed the way that we deliver this care. And to start with, although I completely agree with everything that have, has been said, that understanding the autoimmune process at a level to be able to stop it and reverse it, it's a very important component of what has entailed type 1 diabetes care it's still just a component that will not address most important needs of people who already have type one diabetes. And also, um, you know, based on what Linda just said, absolutely, I agree completely, but we have to remember that type one diabetes doesn't start only in children. In many people, type one diabetes starts quite well into the adulthood. So definitely we have to understand the entire picture of what type one diabetes means. And perhaps, you know, for the audience, if I may, I could share a slide that I was thinking about of what type one diabetes mean. Um, let me try to get that here for all of you. Let me know if you see it. Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so here is the concept, right? So definitely beta cell and autoimmunity is very important in diabetes onset. And perhaps it has a lot of role in the overall burden generated um, on all these various organs because type one diabetes will affect ultimately everything that you see in this slide. And then the concept definitely has to be very integrated and it cannot be done in a single way approach and you know, integrating the genome, protein, transitome, metabolome with the patient's phenotypes are extremely important component. And in fact, in many of these studies that we are doing in large cohorts of people with type one diabetes, I've been privileged to work with the DCCGED, which is of course one of the uh, signature cohorts of people with type 1 diabetes that had taught us important lessons through the entire lifespan of type 1 diabetes, but now we are working together with other cohorts around the world and just to, uh, you know, the Swedish, the Scottish registries, the Finn-Dian or, or the Stino registries. And having learned to work together across all these large cohorts and sharing 
lessons that we have learned had made possible, of course, all this progress. Um, additionally, I like to highlight that um, in parallel, all the progress that has been made in big data, in, in omics, and how to best analyze is definitely going to be an integral component on our capability to solve this very um, complex puzzle. We have also have to remember that what we as scientists may see um, at the bench um, may be very different um, when we actually deal with a patient. And besides all these other components, the socioeconomic factor, the social determinants of uh, health, like we call them now, are due critical, uh, playing critical roles. And not at all to be left uh, at the end, particularly since we have here people from industry, you know, making sure that we develop um, strategies that will allow us to screen at the point of care with simple to use biomarkers that would then give clinicians a guidance on the potential trajectory of the disease in a given patient. Integrating all these components is going to be key for success. We've learned lessons. Um, and as I said, my research span from the bench to the bedside. Um, we've learned lesson a lot from many of the models that we have used at the bench. And um, many of them, in fact, have been demonstrated to not be uh, correct. And learning those lessons and um, being able to admit that sometimes we may not be right, it's also a critical component for the progress. Um, definitely putting patient at the center is, um, I think, extremely important and communicating. This communication constantly between the big data analysts like Noel uh, and, and Kate have already mentioned is critical. The communications between the clinicians and the communications and hearing our patients. Sometimes in my research, I received ideas by just listening to my patients when I see them in clinic. Um, the, uh, and then, of course, capitalizing on all the tools that we have available right now, I think that we are in the best positions with all the progress that we have made in technologies, starting from all this omic and big data to the fact that we have now very, um, uh, very uh, powerful technologies that we can implement in our patient care, uh, and to the fact that we can link this data sets through a variety of electronic databases, whether there are electronic medical records, whether there are uh, uh, you know, industry large databases, whether there are uh, organs um, uh, databases. And I completely agree. Uh, that's not true just for the beta cells that we really need to have a capability of testing our uh, hypothesis. Uh, in other type of biosamples besides blood, it's critical for all these other organs that are targeted by the type one diabetes, uh, you know, itself. So those are my um, initial thoughts here. And um, again, thank you so much for having me. Fantastic overview and really drilling down on some of the top, you know, roadways that need to be um, pursued, I'd say. Thank you so much. I wondered, uh, we do have a question that kind of, uh, uh, I think I think I'll have Dr. Dean speak and then we'll then we'll address some questions. So yeah, thank go you. right ahead. Uh, thank you for inviting me to, to join you today. I'm really honored to be uh, in this group of, of, of women. So um, so my laboratory and the way that I approach diabetes um, research is, is really this interface between basic science research using animal models and, and then trying to early translate that into human studies. And so, you know, one of the questions that is in the, the, um, the questions is, is how do we take this information and get to experimental models where we can as, as Radhika said, have test, testable hypotheses that we can manipulate. Because if our goal is to get to arresting or curing or even preventing the disease, we have to have 
therapies for that. And if we're going to do that, it's really critical for people who sit in the laboratory like myself and aren't the big data people to think uh, and work with people like Kay and Noel and, and, and try to figure out what should we be doing, right? What, what hypothesis should we be testing in the laboratory to figure out um, how we can move forward with therapies? And so I think one of the things that I would question uh, that I haven't heard talked about is we have all these big data sets that are we're generating for human, but they're really new, a lot of them. And, and we have so much information um, over the last century, nearly, of, of animal models. And how do we integrate that, both the information that we learned from those, and as Kate said, the really clean data, the really good data, how do we get that into the system and then pull things back out to take back to the, uh, to the laboratory? I think that's where my interests are as someone who studies how you regenerate pilot cells. Um, that's, that's kind of my perspective on things. Does anyone have any input on, you know? I would like to make one more comment, if I may. Sure. Because we do have uh, our partners from industry here. I would also like to challenge that besides trying to develop drugs to stop autoimmunity, we have to also acknowledge that people with type 1 diabetes, in theory, as we speak, do not have any other therapies other than intensive glucose control or use of technologies and and they have developed a lot of you know complications and there are no clear drugs that are even being developed for people with type 1 diabetes all the companies are kind of exclusively um focusing on type 2 it's true there are much more people with type 2 diabetes around the world than type 1 but type 1 have the same risk, if not higher, to develop some of these complications. And as we speak, um, there are no clear initiatives to develop new agents for type 1 diabetes. Um, I guess I would say that I did see a clinical trial <laughs> uh, that we posted on the sugar science that uh, uh, Novartis had uh, put out. Um, they've got some some new, um, you know, new molecule that they're that they're they're starting clinical trials with, and it's it's sort of like uh, an enigma because it hasn't been named. But um, at least you know, I, I guess it's great that they're they're going for it. Um, but I agree with you. Yeah, the business case is uh, not as uh, good for type one as it is for type two because of the small size of the market. So it's something I think that internally the scientists and the community has to um, think strategically about like how to sort of circle the wagons and strengthen um, the progress um, with or without, you know, the input of, uh, of industry. I mean, I think they 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 can do what they can do, um, but I mean I think that you know what Dr. Proc is is doing and and what TrialNet and these sort of like these grassroots consortia have done is 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 very admirable and has has definitely moved the ball forward. Um, I guess let's see, let's do. I'm going to ask a question from the audience. How do you? This is from uh, the DRI in Miami. Allison Bayer, Dr. Allison Bayer, how do you see this looping back to more basic science realm and using experimental animal models that can assist in the machine learning and filling in some gaps that can't be obtained from the patients themselves? Anybody have some input on that one? Can, can some of these data, you know, from animal models, I guess people are thinking about the nod mouse. Yeah, Others. I think this is what I was getting at. Is I, I don't I think this is one of our biggest challenges with creating a diabetes illness. What information do you take from the decades of research that we have from animal models and incorporate this into it? What's what's actually usable and what's not? And you know, because you know, from my my research, we had a very difficult time translating discoveries made in rodent eyelids into human eyelids, for example, 
And so I think this is this is a real challenge and why uh, uh, consortium like the, the Human Island Research Network that Nina's uh, uh, and others in, in Europe are, are part of uh, from that perspective. I, I don't have a great answer for it, but I think that there has to be some iterative process too to go back uh, to the basic scientists that you know, that, that information also has to be disseminated on, on what they what, what is learned and what is actionable, a testable hypothesis as well. Yeah, how can yeah, I, I, I agree with that? And I also like to highlight along those lines the fact that perhaps um, you know using the um, the technologies and the new learning techniques to uh, allow us to avoid the mistakes that we have made because what's true for beta cell it's true for all these other complications in fact in the complications field all the animals models that have been so successful uh, have all failed in human disease so we have to be able to learn that lesson and make sure that we have the models that would be translatable into the human disease that's applicable across board. And that's why I think a much uh, closer crosstalk between uh, the basic scientists and the clinical investigators and the clinician is needed together with our colleagues who are data mining. They are the experts on unveiling these various signals through these large data sets. And that will prevent us to repeat mistakes um, that, you know, in the end will be hampering our progress. Yeah, that's well said. Um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna run the first poll and see if we can if everyone can see it, allow panelists to vote. Yes. Here's I'm gonna launch it. I hope you can all see it. And the question is, what would a diabetesome, in quotes, need to have to be truly comprehensive in nature? Genetics, cell or islet biology, immunology, clinical data, the outcomes razor style, data plus AI ML, all of the above plus, none of the above. Um, and I guess while we're doing this, I can also share the screen for, I did put the um, link to the uh, outcomes razor in the chat, but we can also, share this, people can look at this while we're running the poll. Um, it looks like looks like most people are going for all of the above plus. Um, we, need a, we need a lot of layers. And um, I mean, you wonder if it would be helpful to have a mouse, you know, diabetesome, sort of the Venn diagram with the mouse diabetesome, the human, and then where do they overlap? Um, okay, so most people have voted and let's share the results. It looks like uh, most people think that everything is needed. Um, you know, all, all pieces of the biology plus the clinical trials and it's not really a surprise. Does anyone wanna comment on that? I could say that, I mean, in terms of the plus part of all of the above, the, um, and several of the other panelists have commented on this as well, the, the metabolic data are also really critical, right? And, and things like glycation products, um, there, there's a bunch of other data that aren't even captured in these categories. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Dr. Turley? I just wanna add one thing too. I, um, in the Occam's razor layout, um, one additional piece I think would be helpful is the concept of um, putting the clinical trial in there and, you, and, and taking a reverse translation approach to try to understand, you know, why did, patients respond or not respond to drugs and um, what can we, you know, what can we learn about um, for making new therapies? And then we can also sort of begin to apply some of that back to animal models. I think if, you know, if, 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 you, if, you, if you can look all the way back to where the therapeutic was de developed, presumably some of it was developed in animal models, then you take it into the clinic, you figure out who responded, who didn't respond and potentially why we may be able to take that learning back to the lab and figure out what part of the animal model might have been wrong and what part of it might have been right. And then I know that's a very long, complex process, but I think it'll help ultimately with drug development. But a piece that wasn't on there and maybe Occam's razor meant to have it there is the, the integration of the clinical data and learnings um, from it. Yeah, they, 
That's that's a that's an excellent point. They have patient groups, and she's got they have clinical trials, sort of like as a resource that they draw from. But I don't know if it's specifically taking the learnings you're talking about, which seem to be very important. Would seem to be very important. I didn't know if um, Dr. Papusi wants to weigh in on that, since she's sort of straddles both worlds in the clinic and the bench. No, I, I completely agree. So. <laughs> Um, I think that I highlighted um, already several of these um, ideas, and I, I yeah. think also that we have learned, we were fortunate to learn important lessons, um, and I guess that we, as I mentioned earlier, we are in the best position right now to integrate all these lessons with all the new um, um, tools that we have, all these new platforms, this large consortia. Uh, whether they are for uh, type 1 diabetes prevention or for reducing burden of disease. And then very importantly, implementing the findings from the research into clinical care. And I, I think that we haven't really touched on that too much because at the end of the day, how to best implement these findings and uh, apply it uh, to the patient in a personalized approach is another very important uh, component of what's happening with type 1 diabetes. And then, of course, like, lastly but not least, making sure that all our patients have equal access to all this knowledge, to all these technologies, to all these new medications when we are going to have them, um, all these new strategies. That's very important as well. Everybody has to have access to um, to a certain therapy in an equal way. That's the only way to move forward. Agreed. I do. It, it, I have heard some people say, well, you know, if you, if you want to talk about personalized medicine for type one diabetes, you'll never get there. But I think, I think it's been shown that it can be done. It's, you know, an example is breast cancer because breast cancer, right. Was at first, it was just like one thing. Now it's very personalized and it's accessible and it's, you know, it's the treatment is very good. So I think that's a, that's a really good proof of concept. Um, and, you know, I think that when we do acquire the evidence, it's also our role to acquire it in such a way that then it will lead to um, the approval and coverage of that specific strategy. I'm just going to give you an example, for instance, with this technology that now it's approved for everybody with type 1 diabetes, which are the continuous glucose monitoring devices. But the reason that they are approved is because we designed the trial that led to the FDA unconditional acknowledgement of the fact that using the glucose data from the CGM to make bolus insulin decision is as good as the meter. That was the critical component of moving a CGM from an investigational type of technology to a technology that can be used at the point of care. And then that led to Medicare approval of the CGM. Hence, suddenly much more people could benefit of that. So besides everything else, besides complex integration of data sets and molecules and pathways and metabolomes and omics, we have to remember that we also have to provide that type of evidence that then will lead to the coverage and obviously access to all these various strategies to our patients, because ultimately that's why we are doing what we are doing. Yeah, we had some good input on that from the CPATH um, director, Amanda Behrens, at, our, uh, at a previous panel, and they are trying um, to really help onboard research um, into trials in a very uh, streamlined way, and I think they were doing a pretty good job. So I wonder if we could maybe just do another poll. I'm going to send one, one more out. <clears throat> and this one is sure what timeline is realistic for the creation of a diabetes home one year five years ten years or never <laughs> i'll put it up one more time so everybody can look at it this is monica a great possible um additional choice would be it, can, can it be evolved it should be evolving that 
Yeah. They always be. <clears throat> Let's start. Developing. Yeah. Okay. Always be evolving. I like that. That's, that's probably the best. Start to start thinking today and start building today. And I think it's also based on how much, um, how, how many resources are going to be allocated and how, how, um, you know, what is the, you know, group or the persons who are going to push this forward because nothing happens just because someone has an idea. Resources and planning have to be uh, put into it, right? Totally. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, and I, it looks like this very optimistic five years, but I, I really liked Dr. Turley's, um, you know, her, um, her always be evolving concept. I think that's really, really instructive and helpful. So I'm going to, um, here we go. I'm going to ask uh, folks for questions from the audience at this point, and please feel free to raise your hand um, and ask us a question. Oh, Dr. Matthew. Hello. <clears throat> Hi. Thanks for joining us from Anodia. Hi. I didn't know if you wanted to, we, we had missed you earlier, so I didn't know if you wanted to weigh in on this concept of creating a diabetesome, a layered uh, data approach to sort of digging into the etiology of type one diabetes. I just got out of clinic. I got the invite for five o'clock this afternoon, which is in four minutes. So I had no idea I needed to be here earlier. Sorry. Oh no. Here well, we I'm glad you're here with us. <laughs> <laughs> I know I think what's happening, uh, Chantal, unfortunately, we've changed the time zone in US and I think in Europe, it hasn't changed. Yeah, <laughs> oops, US. <laughs> okay, my, up again. Yeah, I didn't pick it up, sorry. But no worries. I can just show you, you know, this is sort of, and it would be great to have you weigh in, basically. This is the concept. This is a company that's been put together by a woman named Katharina Volz. Um, she just got a nice funding piece from J and J, I believe, um, and she's developed this um, concept or this approach for Parkinson's, this Parkinson. And we were just talking about like how might we think about developing a diabetesome for type one diabetes. And I'd love to get your impression. Well, again, I fall in the conversation, but. In Inodia, that was exactly um, the, the purpose of, of starting this project, actually, yeah. to um, see if for biomarkers we could make this, um, you know, this, this integrated approach with uh, all kinds of uh, biomarkers. And so the first manuscript has just come to, to, to under my eyes, uh, it, it's a collaboration by many, many, many people. So looking at uh, lipidomics and, and proteomics and microRNA and RNA and, and, and what have you. And so it could well build in making this kind of, yeah, better understanding of, of what is going on. So it's, uh, it's an analysis in, in newly diagnosed individuals, and we're doing the same in people with single autoantibodies. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is time to, to look at this kind of approach where you have like an integrated approach to a disease. Yeah, and, and so this is the sort of the, the, you know, the focus of Enodia then, and, and so it seems like it's it's going in the right direction, right? Well, the whole question is whether, when it specifically comes to biomarkers, whether having all of these omics and making these complex networks and what have you is worth your dollar or worth your euro above just having a genetic risk score and uh, 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 antibody combinations. I mean, that's to me, and you know, I'm 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 not very scientific with this comment, but when I look at it as a, a clinician or somebody talking to families or to, to individuals on their way to T1D, is it worth your while to do all of these complex things? Can, can we gain 
uh, something more than just an incremental understanding. That's I mean, scientifically, it's nice. And yes, we understand better and what have you. But once you come to talking about companies, etc., whether it's worth your while to do that. Do you think it would help to, you know, I mean, in the, if it helps build the knowledge base, can we crack the etiology or not we, you crack the etiology? I think so. I, I Again, what I've learned in the last years, and, and I'm not the cleverest of, of all the, the researchers who are there, I'm, I'm more the woman making everybody work together and play nice in the sandpit. But <laughs> as far as I look at everything, to me, it just convinces me more. It is a heterogeneous disease. And so, yes, it will help us better understand the etiologies, uh, because I'm more and more convinced with everything I see coming out in, in this research, but also, I mean, the research of, of the esteemed people here is that there are several ways to T1D, and then it may be important again for interventions, you know, that perhaps we will have to differentiate also in proposing interventions to specific types of people. And then again, this OM network becomes interesting. Um, what, does anyone know? I, I just, we'll just run it a teeny bit longer in case anyone wants to, to weigh in on that commentary. I think it was well said. I, know, I like this comment in our chat. A difference to be a difference must make a difference, Gertrude Stein. That's fantastic and true especially in this case and many yeah, and, levels. and make a difference mean something you know have a so i missed the whole discussion then well <laughs> i'm so sorry uh it will be recorded and we're going to house it on our uh repository so you can listen to it on sort of in your podcast time or just watch it on a video but um I mean, you, you really added a capper there. So I think it was, uh, it was excellent that you were able to join us and, and at least add that. I think that's important. Um, I do think that, you know, I think so many of you are stakeholders and very important stakeholders in driving this kind of thinking and um, kind of breaking out of some of the paradigms that, have, that sort of exist. Like, okay, well, gonna have an eyelid implant or you're going to have, you know, sort of like, and, and many people are surrounding that ideology, or you're going to have, you know, just continual care and better and better mechanical, um, you know, modulation of the disease. Uh, so I think that these new, I, you know, bringing these new ways of thinking, collaborating, crossing borders, talking, I think that these um, you know, getting these, your brilliant minds together to just to even hear what you have to say. I think that provides a lot of, um, you know, food for thought and, and maybe even incentivize the postdoc that's listening or the, you know, the young investigator, early career investigator to think about new ways forward and how that might come to fruition. So, Thank you very Can much. Can I just make a, a comment? And again, I'm too loud for my minutes I have here. No, it's but great. I just come out of a clinic seeing people with T1D. And so we are using, you know, pumps and 7-ATG and tandem control like you and what have you. And it's such a relief of burden for many, many people. But it remains, as I will not say the word, a, a terrible disease. And yesterday I had a discussion with students, student researchers, and, and somebody said when I showed the Teplusim data, does it really matter two years? And so I asked it today to one of the people with the 780, and she has 6.6% hemoglobin A1C time in range 80 plus. And she said, hell yes, <laughs> you know, two years two years uh, and, and she's an adult. So if, if any young researcher are, are out there and, and they think we've solved everything with technology, 
No, it, it's a reduction of the burden for many people, but the burden is still there. Yeah. And any delay matters. Yeah. I mean, I think even a month would be a difference. You know, it's, it's a tr it is a tremendous uh, e emotional and physical burden on people. So, and I appreciate and laud everything that you are doing. You, uh, this group is some of the best and brightest minds that are out there right now in terms of thinking forward thinking and, and, you know, thinking outside the box in terms of type one diabetes. And I so appreciate your time and effort on this relentless disease. Super, super amazing to have you uh, here talking and, uh, Again, hope you have a, a rest of a great rest of your day and and um, I hope everyone gets a chance to to listen to some of the series uh, that we had, the series of eight that were all driven by women, phenomenal thinkers and phenomenal actors in the field. Thank you again.